And uh, without uh, further ado, I guess I'm gonna, I'm going to uh, share my screen so we can look at some slides uh, relating to this. Okay, does that look okay? Uh, well, That's I'm gonna, great. Uh, I guess if there's a problem, let me know, but otherwise I'll assume that the, uh, the tech is working as planned. All right, so uh, my talk today is uh, titled Capellia, the Gender of Music in Contemporary Jewish Brooklyn. And um, let's see. Okay, uh, on November 29th, 2023, singer and Hasidic theolo theological teacher Hannah Raskin led a niggin singing circle in the Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn. Raskin, who resides in northern Israel with her husband and two young children, was displaced from her home by rocket attacks at the start of the current war, and has been staying for the past months with her parents in the Chabad Hasidic enclave neighborhood where she grew up. I'd like to begin this presentation with a short clip of that niggin circle, held at a heightened and fraught moment in Jewish communal life. This clip features a niggin attributed to Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, an early Hasidic rabbi, and is sourced from Raskin's Instagram page. In this clip, we hear a group of singers drawn from a cross-section of Jewish New York. Raskin described the crowd that night as being made up of several groups, Chabad women from the neighborhood, what she refers to as her usual crowd of women in leftist and queer Jewish communities, and a group of women who arrived together on this evening from Bur Borough Park, an area associated with right-wing separatist orthodoxy. The range of identities drawn to Raskin's Nigan events that she has named Raza Circles is evidence that points towards a shift in the gendered culture of Hasidic Nigunim. The 2023 album titled Capellia is the debut release of Raskin's group Raza. And uh, we'll put some, some links in the chat so that uh, everyone uh, attending today can uh, easily access this, this wonderful record. It is the first recording of Nigunim that approaches the music from the perspective of a Hasidic woman and that features all women singers. This is a new development that is in the process of an unfolding in ways that are hard to predict, but that push at normative conceptions of gender and communal boundaries. Over the course of my talk today, I hope to fulfill a modest goal of describing some of the historical forces that inform the Raza Circle, and to invite the audience into an appreciation of the innovations, both aesthetic and social, that are forwarded by this music. What I will have to say about Raskin and her work is by nature provisional, both because of the limits of what I know and understand, and because of the early stage of this emerging phenomenon in Jewish musical life. To flesh out a picture of how Raza circles fit within the milieu of Hasidic music, I would like to take a moment to review a little of what we have learned in the previous lectures in the Songs Without Words series, in talks that were given by my wonderful colleagues Michael Lukin, Gordon Dale, and Naomi Cohn Zentner. Their lectures took us on a journey from the beginnings of the modern Hasidic movement in 18th century Eastern Europe to the North American context of the 20th century and the role of new forms of media in propelling the relevance of Nigunim in contemporary Jewish life, both in the Hasidic community and beyond. Hasidim, Hasidism began as a pietistic revivalist sect among Ukrainian and Polish Jews living in the pale of settlement of the Russian Empire. Rabbi Israel ben Eliezer, known as the Baal Shem Tov, is considered the founder of the modern Hasidic movement. 
the Baal Shem Tov's teachings stressed experience of the divine through new forms of worship that fall outside of the purview of normative rabbinic Judaism, with a special emphasis on storytelling, dance, and music. The nigun, a genre of vocal music often, but not always, sung without words, has come to be the musical style most associated with Hasidus, both among Hasidic Jews and in the appraisal of the community by non-Hasidic people. Nigunim are typically sung at a variety of paraliturgical social settings, including the Rebbe's Tish, a communal meal, uh, the Farbrengen, a spiritually charged collective gathering. Uh, these communal gatherings are preceded over by the charismatic chief rabbi, or Rebbe, who serves as both spiritual leader and source of communal authority. The voices engaged in singing Nigunim at these events are all male, and as a rule, women are explicitly excluded from singing. The official exclusion of women reflects a conservative approach to halacha, Jewish law, and its strictures regarding women's modesty, typified by the Talmudic statement, kolisha erva, that is interpreted to restrict women's voices in public settings due to its presumed erotic powers. Charismatic leaders of the early Hasidic movement formed courts, or dynasties, of hereditary leadership that have led to the emergence of sects referred to by their place of origin in Europe. Satmar and Lubavitch, for example, are two of the most prominent Hasidic communities in New York City, the center of American Hasidic life, and both of these groups are named uh, for towns of origin in Eastern Europe. The Hasidic movement has a political dimension as an officially anti-modern stronghold of separatist Jewish life. The Lubavitch community, also referred to as Chabad, mediates between an anti-modernist stance and an approach to Kiruv, or religious outreach, that was accelerated in the second half of the 20th century by Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the seventh Lubavitch Rebbe. Reb Schneerson initiated a variety of practices that were meant to attract secular Jews to adopt orthodoxy, as understood by Chabad. Among the innovations instituted by Chabad was a specific approach to musical preservation and modernization. In the period immediately following the Holocaust, Jewish Americans of a variety of, of groups embraced many initiatives intended to preserve Jewish musical knowledge that was seen as newly imperiled. These initiatives included the founding of major cantorial tra training seminaries in the late 1940s and early, and early 50s. In the Chabad community, the imperative towards musical preservation was addressed through the collection of nigunim using Western musical notation, culminating in the 1948 publication of the anthology Sefer HaNigunim. This was followed by a recording initiative supported by the community, which produced a multi-volume set of recordings referred to as Nikoach, an acronym for Nigunei Chazidei Chabad the first volume of which was released in 1960, and this is the, the cover of that first uh, Lubavitch uh, uh, Nigunim record. The production of the album involved the collabor collaboration of Chabad singers with a non-Hasidic musician, Velvel Pasternak, who was hired to conduct and create instrumental arrangements. Let's listen to a little bit from that first volume. <laughs> to their stated goal of preservation, these early recordings also represent the first stirrings of orthodox popular music. In the past 40 years, this style has developed into an industry with its own ecosystem of star performers. Although its roots were based in efforts at cultural preservation, the contemporary orthodox pop sound is characterized by appropriation from commercial music genres. 
the embrace of disco in the 1970s and 80s by Chabad musicians such as Mordechai ben David and Avram Fried were important signifiers in a shift in what sounds were considered legitimate representations of Orthodox Jewish life. As Chana Raskin told me, growing up in the 1990s as a child in the Lubavitch community, the Nikoach albums were an important part of the sonic fabric of life. In a context where Orthodox popular music was normative and pervasive, these early Orthodox albums took on value as an authoritative source of knowledge about musical tradition. Commercial recordings are only one face of the Nigunim culture in Chabad. Nigunim are sung in mass meetings of the community, as can be seen in this clip of a Farbrengen convened by Reb Schneerson. <laughs> In her seminal study of Chabad music, ethnomusicologist Ellen Koskoff argued that singing Nagunim plays an, an, a role in establishing Hasidic identity, asserting group dedication to tradition in the face of modernity and cultural change. As is made vis visible in this video, the symbolically significant public Nagunim culture was male only, with women restricted to a separate space and their voices required to be silent. A third context for Nagunim is the domestic or private sphere. Raskin described for me how her father would sing Nagunim for her and her siblings as a lullaby. These musical experiences imparted a lifelong love of Nagunim for Raskin. She was unusual as a woman who carried a large repertoire of melodies, a role typically held by Chabad men. She referred to Nagunim as being a heritage that she was able to carry with her, especially as her life journey brought her outside the boundaries of her birth community. Raskin referred to her Nigunim repertoire as being akin to a child's favorite stuffed animal, a felicitous image that brings to mind paternal tenderness, a face of Hasidic life that is obscured in most accounts that reach the outside world. Uh, a conventional approach to the history of Hasidic musical life often completely excludes women. Another approach to the study of Orthodox music separates male and female dom domains, a and I personally plead guilty to this problematic but not always avoidable approach to the, this uh, to um, not always avoidable perspective. Two new books that are about to be published about Haredi music take up this dichotomous approach. Uh, my book, Golden Ages, and uh, which discusses a, mus a male musical sub subculture in the musical uh, in the Hasidic community, and my colleague Jessica Roda's new book for women and girls only, an ethnography of the emerging market of women performers in Orthodox pop music. The work of Hanna Raskin blurs the boundaries of these gendered musical worlds. In some ways, she more closely resembles young male Hasidic cantors in that she embraces an older musical genre and a discourse of revival. Revival, in classic sociological terms, is a symbolic form of redress to political problems that challenge, challenges institutional authority through a language of restoration and a fantasized image of the past. While Raskin's music is culturally and sonically distinct from Orthodox pop music, it is making ripples into the Orthodox women's pop scene. In recent years, Popular performers, such as Bracha Shafa, have begun to include Nigunim in performances, a striking break from the commercial styles associated with new women performers of Orthodox pop. Raskin sees receptivity to singing Nigunim as a sign of the great need among Orthodox women for spiritual music experience. Born in Crown Heights in 1987, Raskin was a self-described Nigun nerd with a special facility for re remembering Nigunim. She developed knowledge of the repertoire of Seder Nigunim, or suites of melodies that would be sung for special occasions in the Hasidic communal calendar, such as anniversaries of the deaths of past Rebbe's. 
In 2010, she made her first connection to Hadar, an egalitarian Jewish community that places a special emphasis on music. In the Hadar community, musician Joey Weisenberg was already gaining prominence as a song and prayer leader and composer of Nagunim. At that point, Raskin describes herself as having been a musical purist who felt ambivalence about the appropriation of the Nigun by people from outside the Hasidic community. At Hadar, Raskin taught a class on the Tanya, the classic work of Chabad theology, written by the first Chabad rabbi, Shnur Zalman, published in 1796. In 2011, Raskin made Aliyah. In Israel, she came in contact with a variety of Jewish communities that do not fit easily into the denominational divisions of American Jewish life. Among these were the community in Kibbutz Beit Yisrael, an unusual urban kibbutz located in Jerusalem. Here she met descendants of the Rijner and Vizhnitz Hasidic dynasties, who led paraliturgical services at which she, a woman, was invited to lead Nagunim, something Raskin had never previously experienced among Hasidic people. Occasionally, there were other opportunities for her to lead Nagunim in the communities that she traveled in, but Raskin stressed that even in more liberal orthodox circles where she might be invited to sing, she was generally not looked at as an authority and was always de expected to, to defer to men, if there were any available, who were capable of leading the Gunim. In 2014, Raskin experienced a life-changing accident that has played a major role in her musical and religious project. Raskin sustained a head injury that left her seriously debilitated and in chronic pain. Raskin sustained, uh, Ras she lost some control of speech, forgot some of the languages she had previous, previously spoken, and was bedridden for a lengthy period. After six months, she was authorized to travel to New York to recuperate at her parents' home. In 2015, she moved to Eden Village, a Jewish camp in upstate New York, where she was able to live and do some volunteer work, even in her still only partially verbal state. It was during this period of rehabilitation that Raskin began to make new discoveries about the power of Nagunim. The isolation and closeness to nature, in combination with her vulnerability, brought out a new set of associations with this music she had carried around with her throughout her life. As Raskin explained to me, I ended up living there for about eight months, and at the very end, I was living completely alone. Um, yeah, and it was like fall, winter, and I just would sit in the woods and like listen to the trees. Like I started to like hear like frequencies, um, just like in the quiet, and I would like mimic the sounds of nature around me. <laughs> it was like, it was just what I did. Um, it was also something that I started doing primarily like because I, for, for pain relief, like I started to explore like humming and vibrations as pain relief um, because you, I was in excruciating pain um, like kind of 24 hours a day like non-stop and I would learn like the different frequencies that would like neutral like harmonize or neutralize like different kinds of pain in my body I would spend let's say Shabbat on my own and sing and I started to hear people singing with me like sounds not people like i would say that they were angels like angels would come and sing with me and i felt like i was singing with this like orchestra and it was this it was extraordinary and it was i mean healing it to say that it was healing it was it was beyond i'm saying um yeah yeah it was from another world, that's really how it felt. The healing potentials of singing Nagunam became a central theme in a set of practices she began to pursue. In 2016, after meeting her husband, Raskin returned to Israel, where she continued to sing Nagunam. But now, she expanded her musical pursuits to include other women. She got the idea for the name Raza, meaning secret, and made a Facebook event, not knowing whether anyone would come. Through word of mouth, 
and social media networks, a community of women singers emerged, many of them women from separatist orthodoxy, orthodox Haredi communities. I'm sorry, Raza means mystery, not secret. Apologies for that, uh, that uh, slip in the text over here. Uh, through word of mouth and social media networks, a community of women singers emerged, many of them women from separatist orthodox Haredi communities. In 2018 and 19, Raskin returned to work with the Hadar community as a fellow in the Rising Song Fellowship Program, an incubator program aimed at cultivating the work of Jewish liturgical leaders and musicians. According to Raskin, singing and working in musical communities accelerated her progress towards recovery. In 2021, Joey Weisenberg invited Raskin to return to Philadelphia to record an album of Chabad Nigunim sung by women. Working in Philadelphia necessitated not recording with the Nigun circles she had already been building in Israel, in a community of mostly Orthodox women. After considering different musical options, Raskin felt that this change of scene and personnel was the most conducive setting for her to record, working with Weisenberg, a supporter of her work for many years, and connecting to a musical community, community that included professional musicians and was highly motivated to work and learn with her. Parts of the process of recording the resultant album, Capella, was captured on video. Here is an excerpt of, a, of a, a clip from the recording session of the group singing Yamin Hashem, the same piece we listened to earlier on the 1960 uh, Nikolach recording. video shows something of the spirit of community that Raskin is cultivating. I spoke to musician Eleanor Vey, uh, seen here playing the flute, who also had a personal journey involving a traumatic head injury. She spoke about the role of music in healing and offered the insight that when your body feels like a stranger, the melody feels like home. Raskin described to me how her generation was drafted by Reb Schneerson to serve as members of Tzivas Hashem, or the Army of God. Collectivity and an activist approach to religious life were demanded to spread the word of Chabad and to, and to cultivate zealous faith in the imminent coming of the Messianic Age. The concept of Bitul Chayesh, or the suppression of the ego, was central to the new Chabad communal order. Raskin views the Rebbe's legacy of outreach and social mobilization as having been for the good of the world, but she also suggests that this emphasis on collectivity had a suppressing effect on interiority and meditativeness, 
which he believes to have been signal virtues of older strains of Hasidic theology. Ruskin's music has a strikingly different sonic palette than what she, what she grew up hearing in communalist Chabad mass gatherings or on the Nikoach records. The Capella album is characterized by a pure tone vocal timbre light on vibrato that eschews the rough-hewn sound that characterizes Hasidic male niggin singers. The arrangements on the record at times feature bright triadic vocal harmonies, slower than typical tempos, rich pedal points sometimes played on the cello, the gauzy warmth of the flute playing obligatos in response to vocal phrases, and frequent meditative pauses. Raskin, Raskin suggests that her, her music is reflective of an earlier Hasidic approach to melody, embodying some of the spiritual qualities of the Tanya. Her family lineage, which traces back to Schnur Zalman, seems to not be incidental to establishing Raskin's confident sense of connection to canonical texts and personalities in the Chabad pantheon. Raskin used the phrase, a chiddush that is not a chiddush, an innovation that is not an innovation, to describe what she considered to be a practice of reclamation of Hasidic aesthetics in her music. Inscribing the poetic justice of the image, this image, it is a woman's voice, the paradigmatic outsider, that must do the work of reclaiming this state of musical and spiritual vulnerability. Refiguring brand new musical expressions as a form of traditionalism is a typical stance among Jewish liturgical artists. The image of return to the past to describe musical innovations has played a major role in Jewish music for at least the past two centuries and can be traced back to Solomon Seltzer, the first chief cantor of Vienna. Writing in 1840, Zeltzer claimed that his synagogue art music that drew on the musical language of German Romanticism and church choral music was in fact a purification of Jewish music and a return to the music of the temple in Jerusalem in antiquity. Claims that connect new musical efforts to the Jewish past seem to be encoded into the grammar of Jewish musical life. Every innovation is liable to be rebranded as tradition. Raskin is keenly aware of this process and is alive to the ironies and creative potentials that exist in the invention of tradition. In a discussion of the Nikoach albums, Raskin remarked upon her initial incredulity when she discovered that the album was produced by a musician who was not a Chabad Hasid, and how quickly musical innovations can come to be accepted as the face of tradition. As she remarked in one of our conversations, if you would have told me as a kid that somebody who's not Lubavitch made the mu like arranged the music, that wouldn't make sense to me. Like that wouldn't sit with me in my head because yeah. like this is Lubavitch music. It's just so amazing how attached we become to like pretty recent developments, you know. And especially in an insular community, when something changes and that just becomes the norm, like norms are so hardcore. I guess as somebody who's like, you know, stepped aside from the community and I come back and forth, I see it very, very much because it's sort of like when you go away for two years and then come back and all these little things have changed and people are just acting as if like they haven't changed. It's like, well, we've been doing this forever. And I'm like, no, no, you haven't. Rather than focusing on the paradox of antiquity in Jewish music, I would like to turn our attention to the life of the music in the present day and the multiple communities that Raskin's music addresses. In both liberal and orthodox communities in which she works, participants are invited in as performers and healing is invoked as a central theme and purpose of the undertaking. And yet in these two social worlds, her musical mis mission resonates somewhat differently in regard to its interaction with histories and local custom. In the liberal Jewish community, women have been active as, mus as musical leaders for many decades, coming to the forefront of liberal Jewish life, starting in the 1970s with the ordination of women rabbis and cantors, and the emergence of folk pop liturgical songwriting as a primary vehicle for worship, epitomized by the music and prayer leading innovations of Debbie Friedman. In liberal Jewish circles, singing nigunim has been a long-standing practice for men and women, although the genre of music referred to as nigunim is mostly distinct in form and repertoire from the music of the Hasidic community. 
And that perhaps is a point that bears repeating, that the, the same term, nigunim, is used to describe quite widely uh, varying uh, sounds and styles of music in different Jewish communities. On many levels, Roskin's musical innovation is already quite at home in the world of American liberal Judaism, where women-led communities are increasingly normative. In the environment of Hadar, the Rising Song Institute, and other organizations outside of orthodoxy, Raskin's work is distinguished from other women-led proje projects in that it offers an unusual level of engagement with Hasidic tradition. Here, Raskin fits more neatly into the role of charismatic Jewish spiritual leadership that has already been trailblazed by several generations of women. In our conversations, Raskin used the phrase giving permission to describe a variety of mental and spiritual affects. The importance of permission appears frequently in wellness discourse and has been embraced as a useful and flexible signifier in a variety of Jewish circles. In liberal Jewish contexts, I have heard the term permission associated with the idea of claiming traditional texts and practices that are unfamiliar or partially at ideological odds with the culture of liberalism and secularism, but are being reclaimed towards new spiritual or communal, communal building goals. In the orthodox milieu, the image of permission functions somewhat differently. In the orthodox community, Roskin's work offers a radical critique and departure from the normative. Raza Circles opens, open up an experience of sacred music that is new for many of its participants. Women's exclusion from public music making in the Haredi world is almost complete in some sectors of orthodoxy. Raskin described to me the experience of an adult woman who had never sung before. There's this woman, she's the daughter of a Rebbe in Israel. And she sat in a circle with me in the north. And she just sort of sat like this the whole time. Like, you know? And I walked out with her. And I asked her, do we have the same name? And I asked her, you know, honey, like, what was that like for you? And she, like, couldn't really, like, put the words together. And eventually she says, singing. It's fun. And then she just, like, kind of kept repeating that, like, almost, like, in a trance. And she didn't make any sounds. She was sitting next to me. Like, she was making, like, incomprehensible sounds, you know? And she then told me, I asked her, like, have you ever sung before? And she's like, I don't think so. And she's my, she's mom of seven or eight kids. Like, she said, yeah, you know, I actually knew the Nagunim that he sang. My father loves Chabad Nagunim, so he would always sing them. And I said, and you never sing them? She said, I never even thought about it. Like, I never thought that I could, you know? And that reality and like meeting more and more women like that who, and mind you, some from much more extreme backgrounds, you know, much more insular backgrounds where women are not singing or not allowed to sing or whatever. But even like people closer to how I grew up, much more open, much more, but like singing is like, is it sanuad? It's like very, very heavy. It's very loaded. Like I have to do so much work. There's so much work with women who grew up from to get people to like sing out and listen. Raskin describes her work with Nigunim as a process of giving permission. The permission she grants is different for the different participants in her musical world. For Jewish women in the liberal community, she offers permission to seek sanctity and healing in the lineages and knowledge represented by Hasidic culture. For Orthodox women, Raskin offers permission to access the pleasure and transformation of a sacred musical world that was always just outside of reach for women and girls. And for herself, she gives permission to hear a sacred teaching in the Nagunim that she has always known and loved. This knowledge she has found is both a healing for her own body and a treasure that she is uniquely capable of sharing. 
and uh, I'll conclude there. And I just want to offer thanks to all of you for being here and uh, to Anne for programming uh, this, uh, this wonderful series and to uh, Diana and Brian for the for technical support with uh, making all this happen. And then also uh, just wanted to uh, offer special thanks to, to, to Hannah Raskin for uh, her generosity in, uh, in sharing uh, with me about her life and her work and uh, and I want to encourage you all to to listen to her music. And she's also leads uh, concert slash uh, singing events that are open to the public. And I encourage you all to to check that out. And and also uh, many thanks to Eleanor Ve who who generously got together with me and and chatted as well. So uh, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm gonna end the share now. Thank you so much. That was really moving. <clears throat> um, I think we have a couple of questions and I wanna encourage anybody who's still ruminating and reacting um, to post your questions in the q and I'll start by, um, actually, I'll just start with a quick comment, which is that throughout the rest of the series, you know, every single time we've had a lecture on Hasidic Nigun, at some point, there are questions in the, in the q and about where are the women, did women do it? Is there any chance for women to do it across across time and space? And so it's um, very powerful to see this sudden turn towards em embracing a female context. And I think it um, it begins to help us think about answers to, to all those other questions. Um, I want to start by um, asking not a question about gender, but rather about the, some of the themes that you raised about being within and without of the Orthodox or the, the Hasidic world. So I wonder if you can speak at all to the experiences of the non-Hasidic or non-ultra-Orthodox, more progressive Jewish women who are participating in these circles and how they understand their relationship to that Hasidic tradition, right? Do they see themselves as somehow accessing a tradition that's particular, um, or are they seeing it as some kind of more general Jewish heritage or Jewish spirituality that's that's universal? Do you have a sense of what they understand themselves to be doing vis-a-vis -vis the boundaries? Yeah, it's a it's a great question and one that I would like to explore more. And I, I would say that any answer I give is going to be. Uh, with the caveat that there's a lot more uh, research and ethnography would need to be done to give a, 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 real, a really serious answer to that question. Uh, my sense is that we're living in a moment when questions about identity are extremely important. They're pervasive in uh, the discourse in many different kinds of community. And that in Jewish progressive circles, there's a turn towards heritage music and that means different things in different contexts, but uh, there are a variety of initiatives that are attempting to do something with uh, forms of, of Jewish heritage music. And at times that can uh, mean forwarding uh, inquiries into Eastern European Jewish musical life. And uh, the idea of, of a folk culture is, uh, is, has a certain uh, salience at the moment. And so that is one element, I would say, in, in a, the progressive or liberal Jewish interest in, in Hasidic music in, in the current moment. Um, Hasidic Ju Judaism has always been uh, fascinating to uh, Jews in secular uh, circles, right? There's, a, there's the, this kind of idea of the uh, the Hasidic Jew as a, a literary trope, right? There's a, a whole, in 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 Yiddish literature that's it's very um, that's a very pervasive uh, part of of the literary culture. Are representations of Hasidic Jews by non-Hasidic Jews, right? Um, think of like the work of Martin Buber or the neo-Hasidic tales of of uh, Yidlam and Peretz. And in music. Uh, the idea of Hasidic uh, Jews as representing the folkloric past has been also pervasive since, you know, the, the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, so for Jews in uh, 
liberal, progressive, secular uh, uh, communities to have interest in Hasidic music and culture, I would say is very, uh, very kind of pervasive and normal part of the story of uh, uh, Jewish religious life, uh, which is you know, it, it presents certain challenges to Hasidic people in their interface with uh, with uh, non-Hasidim. So that certainly, the, the the issue of appropriation came up in my in my conversations with with Hannah. Uh, but I think uh, she is has uh, softened that uh, that uh, kind of a. Um, reaction through working more in 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 uh, in liberal uh, and progressive communities uh, whereas now i think her focus has tended towards more uh, a discourse of of healing which has a, a universalizing uh, effect in terms of uh, how it reads in different communities thank you that's really helpful it's obviously a really complicated thing to navigate for everybody everybody involved yeah um we we have a question asking um how does hannah herself um navigate the issue of sharing um recordings with audiences that might be mixed um and i <clears throat> i just i believe that this this issue is partly addressed also by our colleague Jessica Roda in in her book. So for more on that, let's seek out Jessica. But but can you speak at all to to that issue, like how Hannah or even others in this world um, make peace with, or are they okay with, you know, men watching videos of them singing? Yeah. Well, I'm uh, Hannah. Uh, my Again, I, I I would say I'm going to put put everything I, everything I'm answering. I feel like I have to give a lot of caveats to. I would I would in a way prefer to let Hannah answer this question. But uh, since this things are not set up that way, I'll, I'll give the best answer I can under the the current uh, circumstances of what what I what I know and also the fluidity of the subject, which I think is is changing all the time probably. Uh, but Hannah moves between different communities, so she is a public figure that right? she she puts her music out uh her record came out on a on the the um the rising song record label right it's, it's publicly available uh and she has an instagram page with you know a following and she, and she does con concert performances where where the audiences are mixed uh so her commitments to it's a new of like a, the idea of of a, of a, of kind of a privacy or, or modesty are perhaps different than some other uh, women performers who are uh, coming out of the Hasidic world and uh, she uh, d does not put a, a, a label on her recording that says that it's only women should listen to it so uh, I kind of maybe I'll just leave that there that she is presenting herself as a public figure open to being um having her work heard by by men and women great and I do want to just point people again to to Jessica Rota's book on on very much this subject yeah. um sort of related before we move off off of of the sort of note of questions um a, there are a few different questions that have been posted that have that, that are all centering around, but can't women sing in private within ultra-Orthodox uh, or within Hasidic settings? And so um, I think, you know, you said a little bit during the talk about how some settings are more strict than others, but is there some way that you can speak to the, the, the range of what's acceptable in different communities and, and how we can, some come to understand the, the situation of the one mother who is quoted so powerfully and I think probably shocking based on some of the questions shocking to some people in the audience that a mother of seven children had never sung a tune. Um, so, and, but clearly there's a range. So I wonder if you could speak to the practices and the standards about that. Yeah, um, well, I guess I would begin by saying that uh, Orthodoxy is not a monolith, and Hasidic separatist orthodoxy is also not a monolith. And there's a, a very uh, enormous range, you know, especially between Chabad, which is understood as being the, the more liberal side of the, of the spectrum of, of Hasidus um, from some other sects. Um, 
you know, I would say that uh, any any thing that I, I would say is is uh, is, is going to be anecdotal, right? Like that that uh, this this is not a subject that I, I am able to study as uh, in in an extremely thorough manner because of my own gender, you know, as that as a, as a male. Um, that I that the women who I talk to who are from Hasidic backgrounds tend to be unusual in some way, right? Either in that uh, they're from Chabad. Or that they are OTD, right? Meaning that they've left the community and are, have self-consciously, uh, you know, set a, a, a stake to claim as as a different on a different kind of identity, separate from their community, and then oftentimes having um, a critical st relationship in in regards to to the the, uh, the 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 cultural norms of their birth community. So, you know, as as uh, uh, in my conversation with Hana, I, I asked her a lot about uh, about women's music within the community, and her answer was pretty firm that you know there it, there are a lot of limitations on on uh, what women uh, are able to do, especially in regards to the prestigious uh, religiously um, uh, religiously v valued repertoires right of, of prayer leading music and nigunim in in, uh, in in Hasidic communities and uh and there in these in these uh prestigious genres the kind of the canon of the music of the community women are uh, are very excluded it seems um I'm sure there are a lot of exceptions right Hannah herself is a, is a sign that th that there are a lot of exceptions that there are except that there are some exceptions um in terms of you know thinking historically about this issue uh, i would say that that's that's more difficult because uh, as is uh, fairly well understood at this point um orthodoxy has become much more um extreme in regards to its its rules around gender in the past 75 years in the in the years since the holocaust in the united states there's what samuel heilman uh, sociologist samuel heilman calls the slide to the right uh, in or in orth in orthodoxy in the united states and in and in israel uh, so whether or not the current uh, situation of uh, you know, women's very uh, thorough exclusion from the the religiously valued uh, canonical musical genres. Uh, whether or not that was the same in in Europe or be, or uh, uh, before the Second World War uh, is harder harder to answer, right? Because we know that there were a lot of women's uh, religious practices that uh, were basically ended. You know, in in uh, in uh, in the 20th century, so and that many of which probably did involve musical expression, and this is something that you know I'm very very interested in. A lot of people are are doing kind of a, a either a, a work kind of with texts to document what what kinds of practices uh, women women were doing uh, in in Europe and in the Yiddish speaking world. Uh, and then, but to know what the music sounded like, or what what musical facilities w women spiritual leaders had, uh, is harder to know. You know, and uh, I do work uh, on the the Chazantas, who were women performers of cantorial music in the early twentieth century. Um, but again, that's in the American context and and in the media, the media context of of cantors as performers uh, on uh, on record and and radio. Which created a lot of different kinds of opportunities for women to to perform in in uh, in in what were understood as male genres. And but it certainly raises the it, it 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 highlights the sense that we shouldn't just sort of automatically fall into assuming that the stricter the separation, the more traditional, right? That rather actually strictness is not a matter of like falling away with modernity but that yeah. there are different levels and also different kinds of strictness and different kinds of standards at different times, right? I think that's part of what your other work pulls out. Sure. In addition, you know, noticeable in what you just said and in your talk is that the standard has to do with modesty and not necessarily a technical halachic um, prohibition of men hearing women Sing, right? So it's tied into a much broader set of standards that have been becoming more and more strict. So a, a more general sense of, of female modesty, right? 
Uh, yeah, I would say so. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's it uh, has to do with the uh, social norms. I mean, I guess that, I think that's that's certainly the case. And e even in uh, some rabbinic rulings around around uh, Kol Isha, the this the social context is is taken into account, right? Um, uh, and the very uh, stringent approach to Kol Isha uh, is, I wouldn't say that it's it's unique to the contemporary uh, Hasidic world or the contemporary separatist Orthodox world, uh, but it might be, right? I mean, it's 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 definitely more, more. There's definitely there are more extreme rules about women and gender in the past fifty years in the American uh, separatist Orthodox scene than in other periods in Jewish history. So that's it's something to bear in mind. Okay, I want to. Um, I guess I want to ask one more question on the sort of, and then and then get off into a different different topic. The last one um, that was just posted, which I think is a um, an interesting question, is to ask about. What is the reception of Hannah's music in the Chabad world? Is there general knowledge of what she's doing um, for people who are within the Lubavitch community? Um, I my my knowledge about this is from Hana. So, and what she, what she said was that she had received positive feedback from. A bunch of men in the community who were considered experts in nigunim, and so that in private, you know, this is not something that people will talk about publicly. But that in private, uh, they they told her they valued her work, and certainly uh, for shluchim, for for chabad emissaries who are uh, rabbis and their and their their wives who run chabad houses. Uh, she, she told me that it, uh, various people have said, "Oh, this is a, amazing, uh, amazing resource for shluchim, right? This is something that they can use to help help people get involved with um, with Jewishness." So I, I think that uh, the the reception seems to be mostly positive. Uh, that isn't to say that there probably aren't. There's probably a spectrum, but uh, but what what she shared with me was that she had heard she had been uh, relieved and pleased to, to find that. There, there was a there was a positive uptake, although with the caveat that it was in private, not in uh, not in public forums. Right, that's really interesting. Um, while we still have time, I, I do want to ask a little bit. There are a couple of questions in this direction too, um, not about gender at all necessarily, but about the difference in the quality of the music that you spoke about. Um, that you know, when when we listen to the two different recordings of the same song. They sound quite different. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit um, about, um, so one person has asked the question of whether it seems like Hannah's music or the music of Raza or Capellia is more art as opposed to spiritual practice. Um, is that a distinction that is useful here? Um, do you really just see it as difference in quality or is one kind of music here seeking a higher order of musicality um, as opposed to seeking a different kind of experience? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I would say that the question there isn't whether is Hana's an aestheticized version and the male vert thing is the the kind of the the spiritual expression. It's more like the, uh, the commercially recorded albums uh, represent a kind of um, an aestheticization of a spiritual experience. So that they're the if one was going to draw a parallel uh, to uh, I think I think the a, a binary is a bit a bit crude here, but but her Raza circles that she does where where women get together and sing. And, is has this kind of ritual undertaking quality to it, and then the record there's instrumental accompaniment, and it's it, 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 she's working with professional musicians, and there there certainly is an attempt to to aestheticize uh, the music making and to present it in a way which will um, be but legible it, as art. Uh, so I think, so that, that, I think that that's a fair distinction. The, but the but the same thing can be said about the the Nikolach records. I mean, where it's it's and and we even I even tried to to highlight that a little bit that these records were produced by you know, they got a professional musician Velvo Pasternak who made very skillful arrangements of uh, of the men singing in harmony on on some tracks and and uh, they we there the the track that we listened to was a cappella but but many of the tracks do have a band playing with them. So uh, this idea of turning the kind of the um, 
the uh, cu culturally embedded experience of singing the Gunem at, at a Revista Shur or at, at a Fabrengen is definitely sounds different and has a different function than the the commercial recordings that were made and uh, uh, so something parallel is happening i think in uh, in Hannah's music as well where when she works with professional musicians and she there she was also in the context of um of a rather different cultural milieu right she was working with with singers who were uh, coming out of Hadar, which is uh, progressive liberal Jewish context, not with women who are from uh, Hasidic or, or Orthodox backgrounds. So, you yeah. know, I, I'm very interested in in learning more about what it sounds like when she's uh, in her uh, doing doing these kind of ritual versions of this, and um, and I yeah, believe especially ritual more... versions without professional. Yeah, it was not the even like time. advanced amateur, right? Right, so, just uh, ritual ones with just women who might not be able to carry a tune, but who are. Yeah, okay. yeah, I, 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 I think that Hana is working on some kind of a documentation of that as well. So I'm, and I'm very, uh, very interested in in, uh, in learning more about that. Well, so am I, and I'm sure so are um, all of the people who have been listening in. I think we should stop because we've passed our hour, um, yeah. even though. I could chat about it all day. So I really want to thank you so much, Jeremiah, and um, want to encourage everybody to um, seek out more of Jeremiah's work and also of Jessica's. Um, and I want to, I will wrap up and then I will ask uh, my colleagues to just put the links once again to Hannah's work and to Jeremiah and Jessica's joint book launches in the chat so that you can find them because a couple of people have asked in the Q&A to, to have the links again. So we'll put the links in one more time before we sign off. And I will see many of you hopefully back here uh, a week from now for a talk by Mark Kligman. And I just appreciate your time and presence so much, Jeremiah. Uh, thanks so much, Anne. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>